Good morning, colleagues. Uh, you're welcome to the second day. As others are still joining us, we, we are going to have a recap of what transpired yesterday to remind ourselves moving into the second day of what we discussed. And uh, I'd like to invite Anna to take us through the key highlights of yesterday, what transpired. And then after that, we shall have the first session of the day. Anna, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron Mubunke. Good morning, everyone. I'm called Anna Namazi from Makerere University College of Health Science. I would like to welcome everyone today for this conference. As we all know, the theme of this conference is health professional education for improved health outcomes. We had a successful session yesterday, and I would like to thank everyone who attended the conference. 
For that reason, I would like to give a recap for the different sessions we had. I'll be brief because I have 10 minutes. Um, we had our moderator, Dr. Scovia Nalugo, who gave us opening remarks. And later on, we had a panel discussion and the topic was faculty development and content professional development which was moderated by Ms. Faith Nawaji from Makerere University. The panelists under the topic included Professor Sarah Chiguli, the principal investigator for HEPI, as well as Feima Fellow. We had Professor Samuel Malinga, the associate professor uh, for Feima Institute. We had Dr. Ron, Ron Blanc, the president for FAIMA. Then we also had Dr. Rashim Vayas, the senior assistant lead FAIMA Institute. The key points during the discussion, um, we had um, the emphasized building research capacity for both students and the faculty. They also um, emphasized working as a team and also involving the stakeholders on board. These stakeholders uh, include the Ministry of Health, we have the, the Ministry of Education, and we also have politicians and students and so many more. Then later on, we had our chairperson, Professor Roda Wanyenze, who invited the chairperson conference organizing committee, as well as the happy principal investigator, Professor Sarah Chiguli, who emphasized the need to work as a team in order to achieve the goals. She also stressed out the, the point of engaging stakeholders on board. We, we later on had remarks from the Vice Chancellor, Clark University, Dr. Nanyonga Rose, who informed us that the partnership between Clark University and other institutions has been instrumental in building, the, in building and improving much better capacities. We, we were extremely delighted to have our guest of honor, Dr. Dr. Jonas Wald Mariam, who gave us a few insights. Dr. Jonas Wald Mariam is the World Health Organization representative for Uganda. And he gave us a few insights. He gave us an insight on why the health workforce is vital in achieving the health, the health well-being of the community. He also shared with us a framework with, comp with the competence training health professions. We were later honored to have the Vice Chancellor, Makere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, who also gave us a few insights on different aspects. He, en he emphasized the need to increase the number of health workers at all levels in the health system. Then he also emphasized the training of health workers and it should be relevant to the population. Then he encouraged the faculty to do research in the field of health, health profession. We, read, we later on had a panel discussion on competency-based education in health professions institutions. The discussions focused on what is happening in the health professions. The panelists included Ms. Helen Mukakalisa, 
from Uganda Nursing and Midwifery Examination Board. We had Dr. Uh, we had Professor Julius Wandawa, the Dean of College of Health Science, Sitema University. We had Dr. Rose Nanyonga, the Vice Chancellor, Clark University. We also had Dr. Roy, Dr. Roy Mubuke, Makere University College of Health Science. Then we also had Ms. Muang Muanguzi Esther from Mengo School of Nursing and Midwifery. Midwifery. Key highlights of the panel discussion, they emphasized on training our health workers through implementing competency-based curriculum. Uh, Dr. Roy, Dr. Roy Mubuke explained to us what competence-based education is, and it means it's the outcome-based approach geared by attributes that, that desires learners to have during the training. We also had a few remarks from Professor Jehu Ipito from Busitema University. We, we later on had a round table panel discussion which focused on online learning to enhance profession of education and was moderate and okay that the discussions included dr ian munabi from makara university professor sarah chiguli the principal investigator of happy dr rebecca nekaka from busitema university we also had Professor Rose Nanyonga from Clark University. As we came towards the end of the session, we received a vote of thanks from Professor Sarah Chiguli, the chairperson of the chairperson of, of organizing committee. And the session ended at 5 p.m. Members were encouraged to turn up tomorrow which is today for the session. Thank you so much. Thank you for the recap. I think you've ably summarized what transpired yesterday. Uh, and it has reminded us of the various insights that we had. So thank you very much for that. Uh, next on the program, we have a panel discussion on nursing education in East Africa. So we are going to listen to some issues to do with nursing education, uh, which is very critical to the provision of healthcare. And we shall, we shall have a panel of experts in this area to guide us through. Af afterwards, we shall have some questions from the audience. So may I please invite the following people to Dr. Margaret Kabanga. Mili is going to, to moderate this panel. Uh, and you would agree with me that she's the right person to do so. So please, Professor Komakech. You can come up, and we are happy to see you from Lira University. Uh, Miss Lydia Senyonga, you are welcome to please take up your seat up, up front. Uh, Miss Judith Kadu from Zambia School of Nursing. Sister Kadu, actually. I uh, beg your pardon. Sorry for that. Uh, we, we had her 
again yesterday in a very interesting discussion about competence-based education. So Sister Kadi, you are welcome. Uh, Ms. Zayada Nanchinga, I hope I, I saw you. Please come up. And we are supposed to be joined online. I don't know if she's on by Dr. Patience Mwanguzi, the head department of nursing at the College of Health Sciences, Makere University. She, she's currently out of the country, but she was with us online yesterday. If she joins online, uh, she will also participate in the panel discussion. So our panelists, you are welcome. And we are very eager to listen to what you have to share with us as far as nursing education in the country and in the region is concerned. So uh, Dr. Kabanga, it's my pleasure to hand over the, the, the mic and the chair to you to take us through the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the principal investigator, um, ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Mile Margaret Kabanga. I'll talk a bit about myself. Um, in a, a, my past is a, a nurse practitioner, a nurse educator, a leader, and the, um, following my retirement from public service, uh, at present a nurse consultant and a health professional educator, and I'm very much engaged with as a dean at Avance International um, University. Um, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the panelists which we have today. I'm sure each one can mention his her name. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Lira University, where I am working as an associate professor in the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery. Um, I have been in the nursing and midwifery education for now over 20 years. I started from Barara University as a teaching assistant, and I've grown through the ranks of education and ranks of career up to obtaining PhD from Sweden, University of Rebrew, and uh, also postdoctoral training in the global health leadership. And uh, currently I am based at Lira University. I have been the former Dean Faculty of Health Sciences at Lira University, overseeing trainings in public health faculty, um, medicine, and nursing and midwifery. And currently, I'm coordinating the postgraduate training and research program at Lira University. I am very happy and glad to be here. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lydia Senyonga. I work with the Ustema University Department of Nursing, um, and I'm the head of department in nursing. Um, I have a degree in nursing from, I started from Uganda here, Jinja School of Nursing, where I attained my certificate, then also went for my degree at the University of Western Cape in uh, Cape Town. I have a master's in pediatric nursing, that is Cape Town, and I'm also on my PhD track, University of Cape Town. Okay, thank you. Good morning, members. I'm glad to be here on this panel again. I remain Sister Kadu Judith, Zambia School of Nursing and Midwifery. Thank you. And good morning. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yada Nanchinga. I'm a nurse educator. I hold a bachelor in nursing, a master in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics. I'm down on a PhD track. I work with the Islamic University in Uganda, and I'm the head of nursing department. 
I'm happy to be on this panel today. Um, thank you all. Um, you can see, I think the panelists reflect what we are going to discuss this morning. Um, we are looking at nursing education in the African region, past, present, and future. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, um, just a moment. We have Dr. Patience with us online. Please, Dr. Patience, join us. Dr. Patience, are you there? We can't hear you. You can give us her chat. Prompt you. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also a suffering fellow, and that is FEMA. Ladies and gentlemen, um, nursing education is such a, an attribute to us in, as Ugandans. And as you know, nurses and midwives are the frontline health workers. Therefore, their education is very, very important to us. And as we saw yesterday by the World Health Organization, we had a lot of issues pertaining, um, not only the education training, but also assessment and many, many issues with the practice. Therefore, our panelists will really um, give us highlights of those important areas, what we can see to see that we improve and get on road with competence-based training to achieve our intended um, objectives. The way we are going to operate, ladies and gentlemen, I will give questions to the panelists and then try to give us um, your views. Um, the first question is, um, tell us about the nursing training over the years. I'm sure all are coming from institutions. And we start with the um, Prof. Komakech. Yes, thank you so much. Um, um, when, we, when we joined the profession, that is way back in the 1990s. Um, the nurses and midwife retraining has been at diploma level. Uh, people would join for certificate training. After the certificate training, there's an extension to diploma. Or there are people who would join for diploma in comprehensive nursing. And then people would do what we call horizontal extension. You would get certificate in nursing, certificate in public health. You keep on extending and extending, and you remain at the maximum you could go was diploma. But thanks to Makere University, when they introduced the degree program, and we were among the first cohorts to join uh, the degree training program at Makere University. And I think thereafter, when nurses started to obtain degrees, um, the, 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 it was Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Uh, currently now we even have Bachelor of Science in Midwifery, which has been carved out of nursing to be a standalone degree. And I think they are people even thinking of other degrees. Uh, I'd like to stop here. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, just to add on what Professor has said, and also nursing training had to do a lot with uh, 
the entry requirements. Before in the 50s, um, some of the nurses who trained by then, they were just chosen from the community. If they saw someone was very caring, they never went so far. They had P7 qualifications, senior two, and that has evolved over time whereby there are some requirements that are now needed to join the certificate, to join the diploma degree upwards. So also the uh, entry requirement play a big role, though we still have a challenge with that. We shall discuss as we go on. Thank you very much. Next. Thank you so much. To add on what they have said, the nursing training over the years, I will talk about the examination process. Uh, in the olden days, we used to do traditional examination where we would go to the, to the ward and be examined from there. And every person would have his or her question to be examined on. They were not the same questions. But these days, we are doing an objective examination, which is OSPE OSCE, where every candidate is asked the same question and examined the same. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Uh, General, I will say that um, we are trying to move away from the past and embrace the current trends in the nursing education, whereby we are now emphasizing the vertical career growth, uh, where someone moves from certificate to diploma to bachelor's degree to master's and above, other than accumulating so many certificates at the same level. And we are also now focusing on competence-based teaching and learning, as it was discussed yesterday, because we realize that a good nurse need to have the right knowledge, the right skills, and the right attitude. And most of these are not basically achieved from the classroom, but mainly from hands-on training. And that's where we're trying to focus on now. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Um, you can see the trail of nursing. And in the past, things we are Um, can someone tell us something how the training of nurses began in Uganda? That historical background? Okay, thank you. Nursing in Uganda began in Mengo by the missionaries. Uh, that was the first hospital that was built in a, in a grass sized house. Then other missionaries came to Nsambia. We began the nursing and then the, the training of nurses began also. Slowly by slowly, we built the numbers for nursing. Okay, thank that you very summary. much. So you can see, she says that it started from a thatched place. But remember also, other than those ones at Mengo, people were delivering these people in their homes, traditional bath attendants, and the medical uh, uh, other, um, these healers, we are treating people. That is where it was. But now we move to the modern nursing, and we have got a great person, Florence Nightingale is our pillar who started modern nursing basing on the Crimea War. And history repeats itself because what I, I read about Florence Nightingale is what is happening today, the Crimean War. So nurses there are on their toys. Now in Uganda, we have seen the past and I like the way slowly we are looking at structures improving. We are looking at programs also 
elevating from certificate to diploma. Actually, that nursing program used to be certificate, diploma, diploma, another diploma, another diploma, advanced, those kind of things rotating around there. And when um, light came and we had the, the degree nursing program, actually it was a real battle here in Uganda. Someone asked me, why do nurses want a degree? And you wonder, most of the literature is by, written by the nurses. So from there, things are moving up. And I'm so happy to see that we have reached a level and we shall see that as we move on. Um, I would like to take you to another question, my dear panelists. Now, having said that, how do we want to see our nursing develop in the region? How do we want to see our nursing training develop in the region? Because we are training for our East African market as well, right? So how do we want to see our nursing develop? Now I will start from the other end. Yes, sister. Thank you. I think um, we need to have an efficient and effective nursing education system that can, um, that can produce adequate and competent nurses that can meet the, the rapid changing health challenges we do have. Because we are now encountering so many epidemics and pandemics, some are new, some are reoccurring. So we need to have an education system that can equip nurses with long life learning um, experience, because you cannot cover everything. Epidemics are coming that we never had in the past. So they need, we need to, train, to have a training system that can equip them with such skills that they can adopt to the first changing health challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I would say about this, we have to encourage the nurses to do specialization. For example, some nurses to specialize in uh, oncology, in uh, uh, neonates, how to treat neonates, to, to have specialists. Let us copy the Western world that you find a nurse, but with a special specialist. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Um, also, uh, I think also let us look around us and within the region what is happening because we are seeing that nursing is evolving, nursing is ch changing. There are certain things that our neighbors and our world in general have moved away and are trying to do. One of it is training certificate nurses. Um, as we are here and in this conference, we are advocating for health professions education. But you look at, you cannot train a certificate nurse with a doctor together. There will be a knowledge gap and also there will be other issues. So as we move forward, can we try to catch up with elsewhere in the world? Because in East Africa, we are still the nurses who are still training certificates. Uh, we are trying to say we need the outcomes, the patients, the outcomes to be better. But the outcomes will not be better when a degree nurse and a master's nurse are outside in the project. Then we have left only the certificate nurses to look after these patients. So can we also try to see catch up with the world if they are no longer training certificate nurses? Why can't we advocate for degree nurses like our counterparts, the doctors, the teachers who have moved to that area and we see how we can work together with them? Yes, thank you so much. Um, one thing we would like to see is um, a, a nursing education system or nursing institutions mm -hmm. that are linked to other training or institutions. For example, we could have the certificate and diploma training schools linked to universities. Mm -hmm. um, 
when we link them in form of partnerships and collaboration, it gives a way of sharing resources so that the lecturers from the university can even come down to teach the certificates and also to teach the, in the diploma institutions because they are linked to each other. Uh, another thing we want to see developed in our nursing education is uh, the skills, hands-on training. The challenge we currently have is that um, the, the health facilities or the practice areas are very limited. Um, I, if I give example of where I come from, we have midwifery training, we get um, over 80 students coming for the training. And all these 80, the practice area is Lira Regional Referral Hospital. And there are also other students from other institutions that come. Everyone is fighting to get the opportunity to deliver the mother, and the mothers are very few. So um, to improve access to practice, I, I am proposing that we need to think about simulation centers. It could be a national simulation center, maybe owned by the Ministry of Health or owned by the Uganda Nurses and Midwives Council, where um, nurses and midwifery students from across the country can get opportunities to come and practice on modules and get access at least to learn on modules so that when they get to practice areas, they have the very basics. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Can we reflect on the qualification of the nurses? You have experience in your own institutions at different levels, isn't it? Now, what do you think would be the best qualification for the nurses to man and remember the structure of our health facilities, health center from down to top? Who do you want to work in those areas? Um, thank you so much. Another person, excuse me, next. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Personally, I would like to have a bachelor's nurse in those health facilities working there. From which level? From health center. Health center tools mm -hmm. going upwards. My advocate would be if we nurses, we can all go to the level where we can get bachelors and then we go and work down. Because if you look at it, even in our hospitals, it's very rare to find a bachelor's nurse who is admitted as a, from school and then they work in hospitals. Most of them are those ones who had uh, certificates, diplomas, and then they upgraded to bachelor's level. Next. Sister, what are your views? <clears throat> Thank you so much. At those lower levels, at least the highest qualification would be a diploma like Healthy Center 3. Yes. Thank you. Next person. Uh, thank you. Uh, sister, did I get you well? Did you say that the highest level should be a diploma or you make the lowest? Share your experience, please. OK. Uh, from my experience, uh, starting with the lower levels, you find a certificate level nurse managing all the patients as they come in. So I've, I feel that the appropriate situation would be to match the level of training to the roles the nurse would do. So if at the health centers two and three, these nurses assess patients and prescribe, I imagine that the lowest would be at least a diploma because we think that at, with that level of training, the nurse can adequately manage the patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor, now, please. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, you know, when patients come to a facility, they come and they expect comprehensive care. They don't come expecting you to just refer them to another facility which they are not prepared to go to. Uh, therefore, it would be good to have nurses with the comprehensive knowledge who can at least be able to do the basics at all facilities. For that matter, we would prefer to have a diploma nurse or midwife okay. at the lowest level of facility. Okay. Yeah. Now, we are looking at the structures in our um, country uh, versus the nurses. Now, when we think about performance, 
and we think about uh, training. So when a patient comes, you are a certificate, this one is a degree and all of that, isn't it? Maybe a PhD is also there. But this patient, when he's, he or she is being handled, the qualification here is among you, but me as a patient, I want services. So now we have our nurses at different levels performing. What do you think is being done at those levels? Don't you think that there will be a conflict? I'm a bachelor's at this level, I'm a all set diploma and a patient comes. Is there a difference in performance at that level? Yes, sister, you can begin. Thank you so much, dear person. Now, when we are at work, the patient looks at the skill mm -hmm. that each of us has. And a skill is very, very, very important for us. The patient can accept you or the patient can reject you. So the patient will not know the levels that we are, but looks at how do we handle okay. the patient. Next, what do you think in the practice? As sister has already mentioned, the patient will not mind your level of qualification, mm -hmm. but what you offer. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that um, at a certificate level, the nurse has the skills, but may not be well equipped with the knowledge they need mm -hmm. to translate into the skill the patient, the patient will appreciate. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that uh, a diploma is fairly uh, good to equip the nurse with both the knowledge and the skill that the patient will be able to appreciate that they've got good services. Okay, next. Um, I think here, yeah, this is where the scope of practice comes in mm -hmm. and teamwork. Because if we have the scope of practice, the certificate nurse should be know what they are supposed to do. A diploma nurse should know what they are supposed to do and the uh, degree nurse they should know. So if there is that teamwork and the scope of practice which has been rolled down and everyone knows what they are supposed to do, we avoid even the patient guessing because we know who is supposed to handle a patient. If a certificate nurse can assess and send towards the diploma nurse, then the diploma nurse can take over from there. Okay. Next. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, in most cases, nurses work as a member of the healthcare team. And in that team, there's the doctor the, and the other healthcare professionals. So for me, my view is that um, a, when a patient comes and um, whether the nurse would be the first to see this person or another healthcare professional, it really does not matter the qualification of the nurse because it is not just taking the blood pressure and say, here it is, and then you forward and forward. The person wants to, to learn something mm -hmm. from this. Mm -hmm. Yes, my blood pressure is high. What does it mean? How can I bring it down? What lifetime, what life uh, behavior changes that I have to adopt so that I bring my blood pressure down? It's not just taking the blood pressure and forwarding to the doctor to prescribe the drug. And I feel having a, a highly qualified nurse who can, in addition to doing the procedure, explain and do some health education, health promotion, and uh, counseling, in addition to the procedure, will be very beneficial to our patients. And therefore, if we could have, whether it being a master nurse, diploma, or PhD, handling this patient by doing a comprehensive care and holistic, to me, it is to the benefit of our patients and the population. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we are having those levels, but uh, as you know, from yesterday's discussion, our image is bad by the community. So what can it be? Um, what is bringing all this confusion? Is it the training and uh, the practitioners 
at a different level of feeling disgruntled in one way, because if I'm a certificate, why are people sitting and they don't want to perform? You find someone sitting in the office, another one is there, the attitudes are really not good. What is bringing that if we are really trained, each one knows the roles because I'm sure there is a scheme of service and all of that. What do you think, what do you see in your own institutions happening? What is the problem there? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it is true that um, somehow the image of the nurses and midwives uh, is not good mm -hmm. in the practice environment. Uh, there are complaints that we are rude. There are complaints that we don't explain. There are complaints that we work on patients as if we are working on machines or robots. Mm -hmm. um, so it is not really that the nurses are rude or not, but to me is there are gaps in the training yeah. there are gaps in the training um there are things that we should ensure are included in all levels of training whether the person is training at certificate level for example we need to train this person in communication skills and counseling mm -hmm. uh whether this training is at a certificate level or master's phd we need to train them on health promotion and education so that we, this thing of making the person the victim, blaming the person is out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is the, 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 the people we should select for training in nursing should have the necessary qualifications to join the nursing profession. They should be able to understand basic biology so that they are able to explain this thing. But we had situations where somebody completely has never done any biology is mm, yeah. accepted into nursing training and this person cannot explain anything you cannot the person is suffering cannot explain anything so we need to improve in the curriculum content in case they are missing we need to have in-service training that comes and train nurses on these really basic things teamwork is a big issue okay. that we have Thank you. Sister. Uh, I think uh, this is, uh, it comes in with so many other challenges. It is, for me, it is also two ways, the training, then there is lack of supervision, then also mentorship. For instance, I'm teaching my students, but as an individual who is my mentor, I also need a mentor who can mentor me as I mentor students then the attitude and the everything that happens in the community mm -hmm. even from our regulators we have little follow-up for supervision and then also what you realize that there are some few nurses have bachelors and the masters and upwards and then it is perceived somewhere in our country maybe because we are few, immediately i get a master's i'm supposed to be a manager it doesn't matter whether I can do management or not. And then the perception that he, on the wards, if you go on the wards, you find the enrolled nurses work more than uh, the diploma nurses and the degree nurses. I think also it is a perception that we need to change in our profession, whereby if we are trained, you need to give a service. You find the bachelors, uh, we are seated, the enrolls are the ones running up and down. And somehow it is also at the back of their man using the word senior every time senior that is my senior so if your senior is there you need like to work more than them but mentorship supervision is also leading to that no one mentors those nurses at the lower level okay thank you very much um now from what you have um given us what opportunities do we see for the future of our nursing training sister thank you sister um the opportunities we have so many opportunities okay, we can have two two per each of uh, the opportunities that nurses have is uh going and working internationally next another opportunity you said two 
we are giving it to to please another opportunity is to us to change our attitude we still have that chance to change our attitude so that our chances may increase thank you another one oh. we can go for advanced training and you choose the area of specialization of your interest such that you can excel mm. then we can also think of um collaboration with the other health team such that uh, you 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 mend the gaps where you're not good your, your colleague can back up okay. um opportunities for me the opportunities i say is the entry point mm -hmm. marks for nurses because up to now we still take past eight into nursing and normally these are the after children go uh, students going to hsc or those ones who have lacked other courses we just push them into nursing then also upgrading of our profession mm -hmm. can we encourage our nurses those ones certificate to upgrade and do degrees and those ones degrees to do masters so that we also up our education our profession mm -hmm. last prof i think now nowadays ict and digital technologies is a big opportunity for nurses for personal mm -hmm. learning mm -hmm. but also for improving care to patients um, we also have opportunities in entrepreneurship and innovation mm -hmm. we can now run uh, clinics mm -hmm. of our own mm -hmm. thank you so much okay ladies and gentlemen can i open the discussion to the plenary um lead investigator Pro? What you've said, I'll limit myself to a few points, which actually could be concerns. I really agree that we should stop this certificate training. When will these people move from now certificate, now diploma? And we have enough students who can actually join at the different levels. Uh, but the highly trained nurses are not in clinical practice. I know the performance is the same, but if it is someone with a bachelor's or whatever specialization, when they are there, they are thinking about what they are doing. They are taking a blood pressure, recording it, and taking an action. And sometimes this is missing. Actually, people can work together, nurses of the different levels. They can actually work together uh, so that we see the the improvement, the transformation in critical services that the highly trained nurses have. At the moment, we are not where we should be to improve practice. And where the, 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 the masters, the degree nurses are, you see that how they function is different. So can we, can we work on that? Uh, I think I'll stop that. Maybe one thing that is also important I think we need to go back to home-based nursing. And actually COVID uh, was there, showed us that, but there are very many people in our homes who need nursing, who will not be able to be in the hospital. So as we specialize, can we also think of providing a service even at a higher level, not the nursing aids being in our homes? Thank you. Thank you, um, Prof. Yes, please. Um, thank you. I missed the session yesterday. I'm Dr. Tuam Tiava, I'm the Dean Faculty of the Sciences, IUIU. And I'm a midwife, a gynecologist. Um, when we are still in medical school with Sarah here, has to be terms registered enrolled nurse with the different colors of the belt. It used to confuse me a bit. All I could understand is the registered is a bit superior to the enrolled. I don't know, but um, 
I've been thinking if a nurse has a diploma in nursing and another one has a Bachelor of Science in nursing, in practical terms, what can the other one do better? This one. I have a master's in gynecology. So I know which competences exactly I can do that a person who does not have a master's can. So that's a bit confusing, and, and I think we need clarification. The other issue I want to talk about is uh, the practical realities. In Uganda, for example, the, the policy usually Traditionally, the nurses used to work on the instructions of the doctors. That's how it used to be. But now we have a policy where they can, they have, they can stand alone. They can own their own practices. So what are the tra trainers planning for such a situation? You know, actually training people who are going to be working as standalone health providers. They should be well equipped. Um, you said she's the head of the department. She's the deputy dean nursing at IUIU. She talked about specialization. I think this is the way to go in the future. In uh, developed countries, they're investing a lot in geriatric nursing because of the aging populations. What should we target in our context, Uganda, as a poor country? Um, Professor Wanda here, I worked with him in the system department. And um, when uh, I introduced GIA, I worked primarily with the nurses and actually they rolled it out the curtain days you remember um so you should plan to invest in nurses in training nurses which the country needs how are you going to do about this um okay i've read some articles in this um the future nursing should Focus a lot also in research. Um, please. On issues relating to nursing in the future. I submit. Thank you, Thank you. very much. That okay. There are comments as well. So I'll give the three of you, but mind the time, then we get the comments. Thank you. She's also there. Thank you, the moderator, the panelists. Thank you very much for acknowledging one of the gaps we're having in the nursing profession. That when, especially at certificate level, after all level, where does the cream go? A level. We are left with a gap of those who are so much mediocre. And even when they are in, their esteem has gone down. They are looking at joining nursing as a last option. How best can we diffuse this mentality that I'm joining nursing as a last option? To people joining nursing as a, with passion to the panelists, how best can we diffuse this? Next. Two minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much, moderator. Um, so this is Andrew is my name, a student from Makerere University, and uh, I wanted just to project a bit about uh, the future of nursing in Uganda, and uh, I request you to first allow me to start with a, a bit of the history, because some of the things were left uh, behind. Yes? Time. Time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, regardless, uh, let me first say, uh, today is 12th May. And uh, it is the International Nurses Day. 
So as nursing profession, we are celebrating today. Yes. So uh, as a student, according to her, I can see like uh, been talking about the opportunities and uh, where nursing is expected to be in Uganda. Yes. Okay. So the opportunities that I'm currently seeing is uh, there is a lot of challenges we are facing and uh, I want to be part of the panelists that will bring about change and solving the challenges. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. And the last one is this one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, the panelists. So mine is a straight one. So as we are moving forward, of course, we are advocating for interprofessional practice. So my question is, since we noticed that some of the universities or institutions, especially offering nursing, some of them basically teach nursing programs. So what's your plan or what's your take or measures do you have in, in your thoughts that you're going to bring these nurses on board as regards their interprofessional practice or how are you nurturing these nurses so that they can be groomed in an interprofessional manner? since that some of them don't have medics studying with Thank them. Thank you, or the last one. Thank you, moderator. Uh, good morning, everyone. So considering the point of specialization, okay, I, I was suggesting like I was overview is that why don't we kind of advocate, let's say for the nurses at a diploma level to undertake uh, the Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery, uh, because I heard of someone talked about a knowledge gap, because some of the nurses can't explain some of the concepts. So the other thing is that, uh, what's the difference between uh, someone who has specialized, okay, if at all that is to go through, what's the difference between a doctor who has gone further to specialize, let's say in the oncology, and a nurse? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can we get the comments online? Okay, thank you so much. We do appreciate our members online and a lot of comments have come in. Dr. Patience, sorry <laughs> for not participating, but your comments have been uh, noted. And from these, uh, most of the people actually do agree that uh, the entry re requirement should be, we shouldn't have certificate. And uh, the lowest, like uh, Sister Cardo mentioned, should be diploma. And I'm also glad to note that the chairperson council, Uganda Nurses and Midwifery Council is online. And uh, when uh, Dr. Mtiaba, you asked about the scope and the competences, I, I know she has taken it as a point because the, that is the organization that leads the development of scope, uh, the, the scope of practice as well as the competences. And of course, some of these documents are, uh, are in existence and maybe most of our nurses do not know about these. Like the scope of practice, these documents are readily available. And maybe through the educators, these documents should be accessible to some of these people. Specialization, uh, people have noted that uh, is really key. And I think also it has come out from this um, discussion. And uh, people are talking about Moses. Uh, Moses is saying that the change, the way the assessment is done. And I think we had so much yesterday in line with competence. Uh, uh, competence education. And uh, some people are saying the entry requirement, why should nurses uh, be the last uh, profession to be thought about? Probably they, as nurses and as midwives, we should have people come in with good grades. Like we've seen a lot of cutoff. Uh, that is from Jen. And uh, patients also did mention that people should practice according to their scope of practice. And each cadre has skills and the scope of their work. 
And if all levels are present in the facility, each of us will play our role. And I think um, in summary, most people are looking at those issues. And of course, not forgetting the interprofessional education, which has been highlighted. And if you reflect on the keynote, one of the domains which were presented by WHO, one of them was collaboration, and this is in line with interprofessional education. So I think I'll stop there, but we appreciate um, uh, our members uh, who are online and, with, and also you could be able to ask questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, members, the nursing professionals, um, evolving to higher, and I'm sure that we have several nurses here who have master's degree and the PhDs, and they are doing wonderfully well. And we all agree that we nurses are sick and tired of the certificate level. By the way, you people don't know how nurses feel. Certificate level entry, and the nurses really don't want I've failed somewhere, go to the nursing profession. Just as the doc, uh, Ms. Kadu yesterday, they said that they send the students when they don't want to be nurses into our profession. But remember the influence of education is political and the, um, those issues come up and really um, push the nurse leaders to the corner but a lot has to be done. Thank you very much. And I thank you for this opportunity. I thank my panelists. God bless you and God bless you all. Thank you very much. Our panelists, and the moderator for the panel for those excellent insights that you brought out and i think many of them are cut across all the health professions the issue of competencies scope of practice is very important at the different levels so as we continue these deliberations i think we need to think more about this moving forward allow me to recognize the presence of Dr. Mpima Patrick, the Registrar Allied Health Professionals Council, who is with us. You are, you are welcome, uh, one of the regulators of the health professions in the country. And I think many of these issues also speak uh, to what he, he does as a regulator. So the next session is going to be a breakout session. Uh, today we have a breakout session. Uh, one of the sessions is going to be in this very room, and then the other one is going to be to the into the next room, Riz Hall. It's just next door. So when you look through the program book, uh, you will see that there are two breakout sessions. So you are free to choose to which one you want to go to. One of them, which is going to be here, is about competence-based education and assessment. So if you are interested in this, please stay around. And then the other one is going to be about innovative teaching and learning, which is going to be in Riz Hall. It will be chaired by Dr. Robinson Sewufu. I saw him around. Dr. Sewufu, are you here? Yes, he's, he, he's over there. So. Please, if you're interested in that, you can look through the menu and see where your interest lies. And then, but at least we need some people in both places because we have paid for the other room as well. So it shouldn't be empty. Also this one. So can we start to move? Uh, Florence, are you, okay, yes. Please, uh, our chairperson for the competence based. Uh, 
Yeah, in the chairpersons, please let's keep time. The people online, we've also had an option of you joining either room. So you can still join either competence-based education or innovative teaching and learning. Florence, you're welcome. Yeah, they will check the yeah. How are you? appreciate everyone who has been with us for these two days we do appreciate so at this particular point i would like to invite uh, dr uh, professor chiguli sara to talk about a very pertinent issue that is uh, actually happening within our country and that is um, something that we we did a research as happy in the areas of internship and for those who have been observing a lot of things are happening within uganda to do with internships so professor sarah are you ready I know we are getting overwhelmed with, with knowledge. We are, we are getting overwhelmed with knowledge, but we are almost coming towards the end. I was requested to briefly, I hope it will be a 10 minutes short presentation about the situation of internship in the country. Uh, I wish I had talked about this before Dr. Katumba's presentation. Uh, but I hope I'm just presenting it and maybe one or two minutes uh, of us rethinking. Uh, so sharing what we did, because this can, can tell us more about what the challenges we have towards internship training. I remember someone said yesterday that they send about five, six interns in a facility and they end up disorganizing the whole the whole facility instead of learning. So it's the situation analysis survey report about internship, uh, which I'm going to share. And we know that internship is a mandatory pre-registration training, a period required for licensure of doctors and nurses, and I think other health workers in Uganda. And during this time, the medical workers acquire skills, knowledge, and attitudes. They apply the competences they learned at school and actually become more proficient in providing uh, clinical care. Uh, and also they practice or they acquire skills of interprofessional practice. Unfortunately, uh, we have not assessed the experiences of interns, and therefore this situation and analysis was done to address this gap. So the objective was to assess the status of internship training in Uganda with a goal of providing evidence to guide appropriate interventions and policy. This was requested by the Uganda Medical Dental Practitioners Council. As someone said, we have had perpetual uh, problems with internship and they wanted to find out what are the real problems, what's the situation in order to make recommendations. 
Uh, so what were the methods? It was a cross-sectional study, which was done uh, within three months, September, October 2020, over 23 internship facilities in Uganda. It involved medical, dental, and nursing interns, and it was conducted towards the end of internship, two weeks before the end of internship. And 40, 499 participants were enrolled. We used both qualitative and quantitative approaches of data collection. So the participants, the number is there, 499 participants. Uh, 44.7 were female, and about a quarter of them slightly more were married, uh, and a smaller proportion uh, were staying with a partner, had a partner. Regarding accommodation, only a third, about 30%, lived in a hospital facility. When we were interns 100 years back, all of us were housed. <laughs> uh, in the internship facility, and about a half of the interns had dependents already, either children or other dependents. Uh, we found out that about two thirds of these interns had moderate stress. So these is young doctors, nurses, pharmacists are already stressed. What will happen when they reach my age? I don't. <laughs> I don't know. And about 3% had high stress levels. And the causes of stress were work. They say the work is too much. I don't know if it's more than what we had at my age. Finances, they are shouting for money. <laughs> so finances, work and an unclear future they are now ending internship will they where will they work will they have a job will they be on the streets uh and what were their coping strategies talking to families friends uh and to some hard stretch management you know the people supervising them us we are not involved in managing the stress we even maybe don't know that these people are stressed. Okay. <laughs> so financing, the average income was around that. And maybe that's why the government wants to give 750,000. <laughs> maybe most of it was through. And many of them thought that this was not enough to cover the expenses. <laughs> we know that many of them don't have housing. And many of them even move to work using borders or taxis okay and uh covid 19 also caused additional stress mm -hmm. these bulletins are too small so time and work rest. so average call duty was 12 hours about 500 patients seen and treated per month and uh they spent about 12 hours on a surgical, surgical emergencies, about 18 hours on cesarean emergencies. So that's how they spend their time. Uh, is it too much? I don't know. This is the period for work. So maybe they should work so that they, they become proficient. Uh, but maybe they think it is too much. OK. Supervision uh, had a large effect on the intense perception of internship site as a learning environment. So whether the supervisors are there and whether they are doing their work, uh, it had uh, a large effect. And we are told in the last session in the other room, Dr. Katumba, that many of these sites don't even have supervisors. Okay? And yet we know that if they are no supervisors or appropriate supervisors, then they, they, the perception of the internship is, 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 is affected. It also had a large effect on, on, on perceived uh, effort reward imbalance uh, and also uh, on the 
perceived stress scores. The others, there's that diagram that I'm going to, to share. So when there's per vision, I think the stress and the imbalance are, seem to be a bit lower. So the, if the supervision is deemed to be adequate. So what were the positive experiences if there's good mentorship? Uh, if there are deep learning of clinical skills, and I believe someone can only get deep learning if they are fully involved in the work activities, but with someone to direct them, to guide them. And if there's a supervisor available at any time and willing to teach them teamwork and interprofessional collaboration to assist the patients, that was a positive experience. And the variety of clinical patients to learn from. Uh, there's a variety, and this is caused a positive experience and the supportive administration. Uh, and the expectations we are met in bigger hospitals with more specialists. Do you know where Dr. Katumba now comes from to make his recommendations for us who are there? That maybe internship should be done in these big hospitals where there are potential supervisors because then they can better support these interns more than in some of the facilities. Okay, the challenges, the workload, limited time for social activities, they are working and working and working, and there's no time to do other things. Poor induction, many times there's no induction uh, of interns, but also lack of sense standardization of assessment and supervision and giving feedback across the sites. Okay, some people do it well, some people don't do it well because the guidelines are not there. I will not talk about COVID-19, it created a special challenge. Poor remuneration of interns was also a challenge and limited practice in some disciplines, especially surgery. And you know, especially in big hospitals where there was fighting for patients with that, postgraduate students. So here now there's a reverse, okay? Because in those big hospitals, maybe the hands-on is not as much. So they suggested uh, things to improve internship, standardizing internship supervision process, standardize the assessment across the sites, getting guidelines, formatic feedback to be part of the process and not waiting at the end to give somatic evaluation. So if there's a challenge, they should be given feedback and also they should be, uh, they should be taught how to address it, supported to improve as they go along. Improving the induction process of interns, recruiting more specialists into regional hospitals to supervise the interns, and also needing need to improve the training, quality of training, especially clinical skills beyond pre-internship or post-internship exam. They thought that the exam is okay or maybe not okay, but there's a need to improve the quality of training during school, probably maybe after school. They say the number of interns are too many. This was from the interns, and it needs to be reduced, okay? And also improving the welfare of the intern. So what's the conclusion? So the interns generally reported a positive experience. Uh, they learned well, and having supervisors and specialists available at sites. But there was high scores of stress among these nurses, doctors, and there's lack of standardization in terms of supervision and assessment. Uh, the quality, they thought it was assessment uh, and COVID-19 pandemic exposed the ill preparation of the interns in terms of emergency infection control. It required uh, more infection control, which should be there all the time, but this exposed it that there's a gap. So what do we recommend? Uh, medical school to improve the quality of training, proper infection control, preparation guidelines, the government to improve the supply of materials and equipment to be used, the regulator to develop and implement standardized practices, improving induction, 
and also interventions to reduce stress levels and to have mentorship during internship and also to develop inspection plan to periodically uh, support the internship. And you know there are standards as Dr. Katumba told us, the East African community has standards that should be followed for internship. I would like to thank this team of people who did this study and the research assistants that supported us and the interns that willingly participated in this study. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sarah, for giving us that presentation on internship. And uh, I want to open this up. Uh, so one of the things that we have to be mindful, we did uh, this work in uh, 2020. And of course, there could be a lot of changes that have happened. So uh, we are open to, to, to receiving any comments or questions. Let's take, uh, we shall take how many? Three maximum. Okay, she will take three uh, maximum. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor, for the presentation. Uh, as you were presenting, I was imagining the time I did the internship because I was in a certain health facility where there were no experts to supervise us. So you could go on duty. You are either allocated as someone running that shift alone. If or not, you have uh, a nursing assistant with you, and that person could just uh, behave as if he's the supervisor for you. So I realized that you may end up not learning anything, and you end up being demotivated instead. Thank you. So let's take the second one and the third one. Thank you so much, Professor, for the presentation. Uh, mine is about the issue of numbers. Uh, we are producing more than we are able to train. And this has been in the airwaves for quite a long period of time. So my concern is uh, the regulatory bodies I think uh, we know where the numbers are coming from. We know what we are in position to train. So where is the problem? Is it, can we say the regulatory bodies have failed, have not been, I don't want to use that word failed. Do, could it be that the regulatory body um, has been failed uh, in one way or the other? Is it the interference of politics? Is it some forces beyond us? Because I think the council has the authority to say, we have given you to recruit 50, but you're recruiting 300. So yeah, thank you. So let's take the last question. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for the presentation. Number one is about uh, the complaint that interns are many, and we know that they are in a referral hospitals, but uh, patients still come from lower facilities. They skip lower facilities to come to referral hospitals. Uh, in the recommendations, do, could we decentralize uh, services, specialized services to uh, district hospitals so that they can accommodate interns, but at the same time, they, sub, uh, they give services to the patients. Because if you get to uh, the urology unit uh, in Mulago, you get to the surgical unit, you find that uh, patients are really suffering a lot. And if there was any other area that, that could be 
uh, uh, that could be uh, offloaded uh, that would serve a purpose for learning purposes and at the same time service delivery. The number two, uh, yesterday it is anecdotal information. Uh, we got to learn that uh, interns who are privately sponsored are not going to be supported by government anymore. Uh, was this uh, one of the recommendations from this Saturday or uh, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Okay, that was the last one. There was there was one, one hand. hand. Jesse. Yes, hello. One. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Jesse. I'm one of those guys that have just left internship. Prof totally agree with the, the study you made. We are totally, totally miserable out there. My question is with the current trend, just like my neighbor has just talked about, do we expect uh, the interns? to have a worse life or a better life. And then the next thing, we normally preach to people that um, anxiety is not good for you, you need to rest enough. And yet we do work 24 hour shifts. So does the government or the, the, the seniors that we have in this group have a solution for that coming forward? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the average time was 12 hours, not 24. Uh, someone says they work 24 hours when you are on call. The beauty is that people do internship when they are still young. Uh, <laughs> and this day the numbers are a bit more, but also you can organize better. Uh, I think I cannot comment on that, but I'll start, yes, with the recognition that you go to, to, to learn after, after you have gone through that training. But the, the, the nursing assistant is, is pretending to be your supervisor. So does that make sense? Should we still send degree graduates to these facilities where there's no one to supervise them? I know people have said, you know, it is performance. Everyone can perform. But this person was in that place and now went and did and then going and the people who are below a uh, uh, supervising so i don't know i think some a supervisor should be someone who has more skills more experience to supervise someone at a particular level so we are pretending when we say that you are going to these places to be supervised uh the second question was on what <laughs> now remind me was this one of the recommendations no it, <laughs> it was not to stop paying privately. But if you asked me, now let me be honest, I think I would support that, especially with the very big numbers. Otherwise, if there was any control of the numbers so that the government has its numbers, and it says we can only support 500. If you are 600, we'll see, we'll have a strategy of who to support for this year and the others can raise so that everyone is supported. Without that, I think we need to think outside the box. And one of the areas is for private sponsored people to, to, to have that. Someone was telling us that in Ghana, there are more people who are training outside the country than the, the numbers registered. So how, how will these governments manage? But the issue is to plan, to plan for adequate health workforce. Uh, has the councils failed? Yes, we know where these, we know the schools that are producing more and we are working hard as the medical councils or nursing council. The nursing council, I'm not sure, but as the medical council to reduce, because some of these universities are producing the admitting every semester. And this flood has only been there in the last few years. Uh, so we are doing our best. It's not easy because we are in Uganda. So which so which are the, the other two questions? Obi, remind me. The issue, I think you've addressed it. I think I've addressed, I've addressed the numbers. I've addressed that, yes, it was not in our recommendation, 
I've addressed, but I think the, the conversation should continue. Hello? But bottom line, the country need to assess its human resource needs so that people are not mm -hmm. disappointed. And in case it can, so we can only Mr. support if, 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 if more people want to train, that is okay. So long mm -hmm. as they can go through the process. Mm -hmm. supported. And Dr. Katumba had other interesting mm -hmm. uh, suggestions in the morning. Oh. So thank you very much. I'd like to recognize the mm -hmm. presence of the principal, College of Health Sciences, Professor mm -hmm. Demarina Kanjako. Uh, you are welcome. And we are going to, to the second session before we close. Okay. So thank you, uh, Professor Sarah, for that presentation. I know uh, right now in the country, internship is a contentional issues. Many things are happening and uh, we, we are yet to see more recommendations. So at this particular point, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ian Munavi to talk about the association. Dr. Munavi, to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't have slides uh, because this is this is something that we are creating, uh, but I'd like to invite um, the audience to, to join with me in, in a session of a brief brainstorming, uh, especially in light of what we have discussed over the past couple of days. Um, to answer for me the question about whether we need to have a local association health professionals education and that's that's the big question running through my mind uh, do we need this association uh, if, if yes then we can think about the next steps um, briefly just to help us re recollect um, to the last two days we have gone through all kinds of presentations from all over the region and um, we have all kinds of stakeholders from people's people who are vending solutions to learners, the students, we have students represented here. We have faculty, leaders, all those are represented here. And uh, we are challenged by, you've had ministry, you've had the council, we've had all those bodies. And then there's us who are on the receiving end. So the question to us, something I want us to brainstorm, maybe put up our hands, I need to short notice and, and, and share with me your thoughts about us becoming organized as a group um, to drive health professionals education. Uh, remember, we are mixing fields, we are mixing education, we are mixing medicine into a homogeneous group. So the different skill sets. Um, that's my big question to us this evening. I want us to spend about 30 minutes um 30 minutes 20 30 minutes talking about this then move on to closing ceremony uh, so any any thoughts any hands uh we are creating stuff this is the bit about creating stuff you don't come with a set of slides yes i have a hand back there uh, who has the microphone please um i'll take about uh four to five four to five maybe six hands thoughts comments opinions and i hope i'll have everybody students leaders, everybody. Then when we are done, I'll ask Professor Chiguli to come and share some final thoughts on this. Thank you. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tamba Alan Crispus, once again. Uh, about the association, oh, well, I thank everyone for, for giving us the opportunity as students to be here, to be part of this, this conference. It has inspired us and yeah to greater things. Uh, about the association, previously as Professor Chiguli was starting, she exclaimed about how we were overwhelmed by knowledge. I think, yeah, because we've had a lot to contemplate and consume in just two days. And the speakers have literally been given five to 10 minutes maximum to present whatever 
was in their research. But I would think if there was an association, that, that would give us more room for interaction and sharing these great ideas for transformation and transition of our society. Because I think that is literally the basic, the basic vision, transforming society through this. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, about the association, I would also, I would also, I would, if it could be a recommendation that students now, like just us, should also be in inclusive. Uh, why? Because if you're looking at you're looking at education and health, uh, it is us, the students, that are going to maybe come over to take up the positions of, let's say, Professor Chiguli, Dr. Mnavi, uh, in the times to come. But so if we are groomed earlier from the roots, because I believe for every tree, its strength within the blossoming wind is, is attributed to its anchorage to the roots. So I believe if we started earlier on, we would not have much of these challenges of incompetence later on in the professions, probably of teaching or the education profession in the medical field. Because so I believe having students involved it will increase effectiveness and re better realization of the vision thank you okay uh, keeps going off that that's a voice from the future literally uh, uh, a voice from the thank future. you so much this is uh, a brilliant idea and uh, i'm happy to be associated with it. I teach, and whenever I'm in class, I look at the employment opportunities, waning every now and then, I feel what, why should I teach? At one point, I, be, I am tempted to think, why don't we first seize a training for the moment? Uh, because our students will get out then uh, jobs. But the problem is we are looking at one, hospitals, number two, universities. Every time you see, uh, in, you sit in circles of students there, you know they are going to open up a university, probably will teach anatomy and so on. But then uh, this association, uh, my uh, suggestion would be to innovate and widen the scope of uh, livelihood for the professionals. I've dealt with the pharmacists, but uh, the pharmacists uh, in the country, majority, uh, one of my colleagues, I don't know whether it's true, uh, a pharmacist told me that uh, when you do, the, after doing internship, you do in, uh, registration exams. And he told me the purpose is to limit pharmacists coming on market. And why should that happen? Okay, uh, it's because of uh, trying to limit uh, the uh, the cake, the share that is available. Pharmacists can get into industries and do production. We do import quite a number of uh, healthcare products. Why don't we do them here? We have the capacity uh, to to do them. Um, we during covid there was a plan to open up a plant i think to to start manufacturing primers for dna because we realized that we spent a lot of money uh, in uh, in buying primers that were used in covid testing the project i don't know where it ended similarly these medicines we can uh, uh, we can harmonize the pharmacies we have start produ uh, producing medicines here and then we uh, we even export then the medical field uh, surgeries you've seen uh, ministers uh, as he died outside in italy and uh, before the ugandans who worked on them i think if we can have the industry uh, grown here uh, these young ones coming we will not have uh, to look at professor chiguli's position when uh, then Dr. Mnari, when is he getting off? That, that shouldn't be a worry. I uh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, you had a mixture of things in there. Uh, so I've had uh, knowledge transfer from the younger generations to the older ones. 
And I think it was about networking, opportunity for networking across disciplines, across groups. Yes, I think so. Uh, another thought, who has a microphone? Yes. This is Senkuke Shafik from Makere University School of Public Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ian Munavi, for the opportunity and the rest of uh, uh, the other brilliant brains that we have behind this uh, conference. Uh, as a student, I've managed to, to be the former president, interim president for Makere University, Environmental Health Students Association, Moesa. But when you look at these students' associations, they bring students close and they're able to uh, bring their ideas and share them to the broader community. So I think really, if we are able to come up with uh, this society and association as Uganda health professionals, it will give us uh, a, a firm foundation for which we can air out all our opinions to different stakeholders and different uh, um, opinion le uh, leaders in our country and the globe at large. So as um, health professionals, let's align ourselves properly and uh, involve uh, different cadres. As Dr. Ian highlighted, we are going to involve each and every person in line with health, but we shall include or even people in the line of education. So let's include everyone who is willing and uh, is willing to push this uh, to a greater point uh, so that we can achieve big. As a student, uh, during my course of leadership, I managed to merge other environmental health uh, students all over the country. And right now we have a federation of environmental health science students of Uganda. So we, we are opting that if we have such a federation of uh, health professionals, we, are, we can uh, look into joining into this in the near future. Most of us have high dreams of joining the academia because when we have very many teachers, obviously we can transform our communities and have better health. That will be my take. Uh, I bring you warm greetings from Akari University School of Public Health. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now that, that, that's been the younger people. Uh, where, the, where, the, where, where, are my, where are my age mates? Uh, where, are you my age or yeah? <laughs> almost? Okay, let's, let's, have, uh, let's have him. He said he's almost my age. Uh, I've heard a lot from the young people. Uh, are the old people saying nothing? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I'm Patrick Lulu from uh, Clark International University. Um, I have a postgraduate diploma in medical education. Um, it is a brilliant idea to, to have an association or a society, especially that focuses on uh, health professionals, educators. Um, I personally, by the idea, one thing that I will wish to mention is that I know there is uh, an associ another association which is uh, called uh, Medical Educationist Association. And this, of course, it takes in a majorly those who have uh, background training in uh, medical education. I will wish that um, as we talk about um, forming a society uh, for health professionals, educators, let us uh, talk with them, especially the leaders of this particular association. In my opinion, as much as some of the things we do may be different, uh, there are so many things that, uh, that makes us actually similar. And so that is, a, that is my, uh, my opinion. Otherwise, when we have an association like this, especially bringing up the young people who becomes more easy. And for us to be able to actually work together becomes more easy because then you know who to approach and who to actually talk to in case there is need to do something specific in line with uh, health professionals education. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll go to the comments online shortly, but before I get there, I want to uh, just pass the mic to him. He's, he's a professor. We shouldn't leave this room without professors saying something. Um, your thoughts on this? 
Yes, thank you so much, uh, uh, colleague, professor. Um, yes, I think um, health educators span from those working in the communities, those uh, working in the certificate, diploma, degree, and then those ones in universities and so on. universities or maybe um that's something we can think about um somebody is saying that we can't hear uh the hands have disappeared i hope i didn't scare anybody from the online community i was going to say somebody unmute your mic uh yes there's still hasifa there all right hasifa and etiang you're back all right hasifa first online and then um hasifa first and etiang please unmute your okay, mic thank and you Thank you, Dr. Ian. Um, actually, making an association will be very helpful because it will also help to streamline who should train these health professionals. Because you find that some institutions, actually, some people are not qualified to train these students. That's where we are getting some challenges. There are no proper guidelines. At the same time, since health professions education involves two bodies or ministries, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education, if we make an association, it will help us to bring these two bodies on board to see how we can help these trainees. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Etiang, your hand is up, also online. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ian and the, the conference delegates. Uh, mine is that it is long overdue. We would have rather had it even yesterday. Because you cannot always stand and influence policy, guide the quality of training if you are not together. So we need really a foundation where by the end of the day, a session will be able to speak, speak, maybe in terms of policy, in terms of guidelines, and maybe we'd have uniform form of training and also share experiences. Like for us who are just joining, we have a, the elder guide us, main actually the young, and then the chain continues because we have where to, to really get on. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So, so what have I had? I've heard that the association would have an opportunity for us to network. One more hand. Okay, the, the microphone can run to you, someone my age, you'll be the last person to contribute. So I've had an opportunity for us to network, and I've also picked that it's a fantastic opportunity for us to pick knowledge from the, the young ones. Uh, you have institutional memory to pick knowledge from the older people, and maybe the older people to learn the new things also. So 
I'm hearing we need it. Is my friend disagreeing or you're agreeing? Chair, Chair I'm agreeing with you uh, that we need to have it. But uh, I think before we go to that level, there are a number of things or questions we need to ask ourselves. The first thing uh, it has been mentioned, there's something similar somewhere. So are we duplicating? Are we coming up with something new? And as we do so, what kind of gaps are we trying to fill? And as we do so, then we should be asking ourselves, what would be the objectives of this association? Because surely there must be something to drive what we are going to do. Then think of the membership. So who qualifies to be a member? Because the thing is, is it because I can walk into a classroom and I teach medical thing, then I'm a member? Or do I have, or do, should I have been, been belonging to a particular association somewhere which is related to, to medical teaching, then for me to be a member? So I think those would be things to be able to think about. And then, of course, uh, as we yearn for it, what do we want to achieve? What would be the functions of this association? Because it has to be very clear that uh, there are things we should be able to guide us. Now, uh, from your presentation or from your question which you're posing to us, we are talking about Uganda. Now, what we know is that there has been that move to try to think uh, regionally, thinking of the East African community. So as we think of our association, what is happening in other countries? Do they have something similar? Or do they have nothing? And so when you think about this, are we uh, probably uh, at setting the pace, okay? And therefore, at the end of the day, where are we headed? And then probably another thing I would wish us to think about is because many times we get excited, especially when you have a sitting like this, people get very excited about something, but as soon as you walk out of the room, then the idea just dies, okay? So there's the element of sustainability. Sustainability in terms of membership, which should be critical, sustainability in terms of function, uh, financing the, 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 the association to be able to go forward. So Chair, as much as I agree, I want to believe that there are some issues or some questions we need to ask ourselves before we take the next step. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much. This is fantastic. That's why I wanted people my age and people younger than me to all participate. Uh, Professor Shiguli, do you want to close this discussion? She, she's beyond my age, so she, she comes last. <laughs> she actually taught me. Prince, they've said that people want to take my position. I have no position. Uh, it has been very good discussion. And we fear that the other association of people trained in medical education, uh, do you know they are there? Don't we have gaps? What have we been discussing since morning? That we still don't know how to teach that we don't know how to assess. So from what we've been discussing since yesterday, it seems there's a real gap, okay? There is a real gap which we can close by coming together and having a community of practice, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, name it people who train health professionals so that we can discuss pertinent issues. We are not going to do what the other people are doing, okay? But everyone contributes to the effort of, you know our vision? Transforming health professions education. Have we achieved that? No. Do we work together? We are told that our curricula are outdated. So to me, there is a need. Don't you want once a year to come together and share, listen to what Lira is doing, pick what Kabal is doing, listen to what Bustema, listen to what the students are doing. So it is collaborating, working together, belonging, so that I know what sister in Mengo is doing. I learned from her and she learns from me. To me, that's what, how I look at that. I've been, um, I've, I've attended some medical health professions education, not only medicine, uh, since 2002. 
and these these people are in different continents every year i can count the years that i've missed but you know when you go and you meet people who think like you we have people here who have traveled from south africa can they stand up for recognition So what brought her here? The passion, the love. We have people from Rwanda. Please stand up for recognition. Okay, I don't know where she is. Uh, people have been on the online from Ethiopia, from wherever, from Uganda, from Kabal. Do we have that every day in our small, because we have a diploma in medical education, because we have been trained as tutors, we need to get advice from these people? Do we need to? But you know, once we have that, then we can work with those people. Because working together means that we are moving. We had someone from World Vision. What is he? He told us that you people, you are thinking inward. You are only thinking doctors, nurses. You are not thinking about other stakeholders. So the organization that we are looking at will involve all stakeholders, including the students. The students will be a very big network within that. I'm just telling you my vision, what I think what I think is missing and why I love these two days. That there's someone who came from Germany. Okay. And yesterday we had a team from FEMA. It's all the same vision. Should we say that because there's a FEMA Institute, we should not do anything about it? No, all of us need to stand up work together towards what we want to happen and contribute and do research and share ideas and train each other. But in this room, maybe we may not be able to answer the questions that he asked us, what will be the goals? What will be the objectives? How shall we do that? And probably that is what we need Ian to lead. <laughs> And then maybe later on, maybe online we can meet, or maybe next time we meet, we can see how to move forward. Okay, that is my, that is what I think about. Uh, that yes, we can move together. Faith, now what do you, you you remember what she said yesterday? I remember in 2016 she was a medical student, a nursing student, presented, and she has continued working in that line. Okay, so it is what we see people growing, but growing as we work together, we should stop working in silos. Maybe if we have a platform where we can work together, we also work together as we train our students and they work together. I don't want to, to, to talk a lot. I just want to thank all of you for having actively participated. Those online, thank you very much. Uh, we have come to the end of our sessions and our day. I don't know, Ian, if you want to make some remarks before we invite. Uh, he says no, but I think moving forward, we shall have a committee of three or four people representing the different disciplines here. It will not only be Makerere, and they will help us draft something that we shall sit down, discuss, improve as we move forward. So someone talked about the East African uh, uh yeah that is for all of us together but you know we need to be strong in the country because all of us cannot effectively participate do they have something similar in kenya i don't know i don't think so because we are part of that but i know that there are people who are passionate about education in other countries so with those few remarks i would like once again to thank our founder the nih through the happy project thank everyone madam principal we've had very fruitful two days
the conference was opened by the represent that the WHO representative Uganda, uh, who set us off with a presentation on the WHO framework for competence based training. Uh, Vice Chancellor of the University was with us, Vice Chancellor of Clark University. We've had deans of Busitema, IU, IU, which other dean have I forgotten? You see, Lira, yes. Okay, so we've had people from Kabale, we've had people from the nursing uh, council online. I won't, if I start mentioning, I'll forget some. So maybe I should stop there. We've had students, they presented, and the whole two days have been very fruitful. Well, thank you that you've found time to come and join us and we'll kindly request you to come uh, address this congregation and close this conference. Thank you. So please, let's welcome the principal. Thank you very much, Professor Chiguli. Thank you, Chair of the session. And thank you all participants that are here in person and those that are online. Um, my name is Damalina Kanjako, Principal for the College of Health Sciences. And I'm happy to be here. First of all, I want to congratulate Professor Chiguli and the team, the HAPI, the Health Professions Education Initiative. I want to congratulate you upon holding this meeting. Uh, because of uh, other engagements, I was not here physically, but I attended some of the online sessions and I found it fit to come and at least speak to you as, as you end this session because I enjoyed the sessions that you have had and it is really great evidence that a lot is happening in health education. The interesting thing is that education is one thing that does not end. And at the College of Health Sciences, we train lifelong learners. So as I was sitting here and Professor Chiguli was saying, do we have gaps? Are we doing well? Of course, there are gaps and there will still remain gaps because I don't expect a time when an educator will say, I have it all now, then they will stop being an educator. So if you are an educator, you need to keep innovating in education, not forgetting the purpose of education. The purpose of education is to transform individuals, to transform societies. And that is our mission at Macri University College of Health Sciences. So I want to just by a show of hands take a note of how many health profession educators are here. Okay, majority of you are health profession educators. What are the rest of you? <laughs> So the health professions learners, please raise your hands as well. Okay, so health professions learners are also here. Um, funders to health education programs. Do we have some funders here? The funders are not here. So the learners here, you're not paying tuition fees. You're not paying the universities where you're learning from. If you are paying your tuition fees, you are a funder of health professional education because it is because you pay and go to this health institution to train. That is why there's even such a thing called health professions education. 
So don't sit there and think that Professor Chiguli is the only health professions educator. You're all health professions educators. And so one of the reflections I want to leave you with is who are we as health professions educators? If you are able to answer that question, then it will inform the rest of the initiatives you have. What do we do as health professions educators? And for who do we do what we do? Are you doing this for yourself? Are you doing this for your institution? Are you doing it for the patient? Are you doing it for the country? So we need to answer those questions. And as I mentioned earlier, the other questions I had, some one of the students said that they are not involved in health professions education, they should be involved. And the other question I had before he said that, are students involved in health professions education? Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, students are involved. So who was saying that the students need to be involved? Students are already involved in health professions education. So the other interesting question I want to leave with you is what is the relationship between health professional education and employment. Because some people are relating jobs to education. Somebody said if there are no jobs, we should stop educating. So what is the relationship between education and employment? If you're a patient, do you need a certificate or you need skills of a person? And if you have jobs, are you going to hire people who have a certificate or are you going to hire people who have skills and competences? So that is what we need to understand. The, the other thing I want to talk about is community engagement in health professions education. What communities are we engaging? Of course, among us, I know there are, I've seen there are educators, there are learners. Who else in the community needs to be here? You have talked about the ministries, education and health, but are the patients here, the users of our services, are they here? When we get them on board, then we can, it will be very interesting to hear from them. What kind of health professions do, you, do we want to have? They'll tell you what kind of health professional they would like to have. Then you assess yourself and say, are we producing the right health professional that the community needs? Do they want to be treated by health professionals who are well-regulated or those who are not? Do they want those who have skills and competences or those who are not? Do they want those who refuse pre-internship exams or not? Okay. I'm sure your patients will also be comfortable to know that as health professionals, you're well-regulated, you have the skills, and those skills are examined and tested because when they come to your clinics, they don't first ask, show us your certificate. They just come to see a medical doctor. And I'm sure you have heard a lot of their views, the community. So is our product addressing the views of their community? So the other challenge I want to leave with you is monitoring and evaluation and implementation science in health professions education. Is it happening? as the institutions do you have frameworks for monitoring and evaluating the good thing the other good thing about education i told you it is first of all the good thing is that it doesn't end it is continuous the second good thing about it is that every day is a project so if you're a teacher every single day you are teaching 
it's a project. Are you evaluating that project? Are you able to tell how your students were at the beginning of the module, at the end? And if you have taught for four semesters, do you have the data to show how your students have transformed from the beginning to the end? Or do you want an association to tell you to do that? <laughs> so by the time you, you should be able to assess yourself as an educator, write an innovative project of your own, assess students, assess attitudes, assess your, your, all the modules. There are things you assess like examinations. Those are different. There are processes that you assess. Are you monitoring them? Are you documenting them? All these are very important, as we know. And implementation science is important, as I've mentioned. It helps you to have a method, implement it, evaluate it, change it, have another one, have results, and monitor. And that is all that we have been discussing in, this, uh, in these two days. So I want to encourage you to have hypothesis-driven research in education. And this is as simple as coming in the morning and, and reviewing your methods and you set up an hypothesis. What would improve the punctuality of my students, for example? They, you set out and study it and find out and present to us what would improve the attitude of your students? Those, those are some of the things that we are expecting to hear from you, health professions, educators. So again, I want to congratulate uh, the team about this health education partnership initiative. Professor Chiguli says it's a project, and indeed it's a project funded by the NIH, uh, which ac actually developed from the MESAO, the Medical Education uh, Initiative, MEPI and MESAO. Now we have health professions education. So how many projects are we expecting? So to me, I charge you to have this as a health education, health professions education initiative that is a program that grows into a program. Start thinking about how institutions subscribe to this program. As an institution, are you part of this initiative? And how can we sustain it? Do we need subscription fees? Do we need to do? Because already I can congratulate you that the initiative has been set up. So how do you sustain this initiative is what we need to look at. And the initiative has different objectives, which are very many, including conferences like these, including other things. So we don't want to say that you don't have a happy conference next year because the project ended, yet the initiative is continuing. So let's congratulate ourselves about starting a health education initiative and now start discussing how can we have this as a lifelong initiative in the history of medical education in Uganda, in Africa, and globally. So with those remarks, I wish the end and I want to thank you. And I'm looking forward to this lifelong health education initiative nationally and globally. I thank you. So thank you, principal, for that. I think uh, with that, we close the conference and we can continue networking over a cup of tea outside. Thank you so much.